Namaste and in La Catch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host, and we're going to have a great conversation with a woman who is named Eileen Build, and she is quite the builder, let me tell you. She's the founder and CEO of, and executive producer for Otel Universe, which stands for Ordinary to Extraordinary Life. And she works with her husband in doing that, Trevor. And she's talk show host for, and the show's obviously called, Ordinary to Extraordinary Life. She's an author and international columnist and masterminds panelist for Biz Catalyst 360, which is where we met. And she's also got a master's degree in transpersonal psychology from Atlantic University. So this is going to be a great conversation of exploration, and uh, we're just going to have some fun. Eileen, welcome. We are. Thank you, Zan. I am so honored and excited to be on your show today. So we're just going to dive right in, right? And, you know, the whole aspect of Namaste and in La Catch is I recognize what's in you and I'm another you. So how can we reflect that together in its best way? First place is the inner side. How did you find your inner voice? And, and you know, what was, tell me a little story about when you first discovered it, what it was like, how old you were, the situations, things like that. If you would, please. Well, yes, thank you for asking. Uh, you know, I've, I've been on a journey of self-discovery since I had my, what I call, awakening when I was about 40. However, in that time since then and now, and believe it or not, I'm almost 60, um, <laughs> I, I tend to go back in time uh, as I continue to evolve and, and come to those higher levels of awareness of who am I, why am I here, and it takes me back to about age five or six. I'm going to start back there. Wonderful, wonderful, and because that's where it starts for most of us. And because of the peers, school, family, church, all that kind of stuff, we, especially if we're really open at that time, we kind of get uh, marginalized over time. And, oh, and absolutely. Side of that, because it's not supported as kids. Oh, that, you said it exactly. And I realized that's what happened uh, to my sense of self and autonomy. And um, what I've recognized and have come to understand is that I'm, I'm uh, very connected and I was born that way. And, um, but I think as a general society, we don't understand what that means, what that represents. I was just going to say, so... I was very connected. Unpack that. What's that mean okay. to you? Yeah, that means that um, I see the world not like this, but I see it in this greater scope and I feel it and I, I attune to it. And I'm a little different because I was born with um, hearing, uh, hearing loss of 60% hmm. uh, to, due to nerve damage. So that, uh, you know, anytime there's a handicap, uh, that's visual, audio, or speech, other parts of our six senses. Interesting things come... how we compensate. Yes, yeah. yeah. And accentuate and so, our other senses accordingly. Exactly. So I, I've come to recognize and, and nurture those six senses as an adult. So at that five or six age, um, I was just totally open, naive, you know, innocent, and just living my life in this connectedness that was not understood, whether from the general society or from um, those close to me. So I shut down. I realized, you know, I, I disconnected from that connection because I probably subconsciously, I mean, six years old, you're not that, that aware, but I think subconsciously I realized, okay, people aren't seeing what I'm seeing. They're not hearing what I'm hearing. They're not, you know, they don't have the same connection. And um, I'm sure part of me was scared, you know, can I, can I be in the world that yeah, way? No, right. I didn't, right. I didn't, I didn't fit kids, in. It's all about fitting in and, and social dynamics, having friends and, and, right, you know, right. things. and I, you know, I'm kind of like you, I was pretty much a loner as a kid. I was off doing my own thing. Yeah, I remember sitting in the driveway with my, my, all my, uh, you know, dolls and, 
and paraphernalia. And I was happy as a bee to just be outside in nature playing by myself. And I'm sure there were some other, you know, parts of that uh, experience as well. And it wasn't, you know, I did, I'm sure that age I didn't question it until, you know, when we start interacting and we get old and we realize we're different from everybody else around us, um, you, I think you start to question and shut down. And so uh, it wasn't until I was having a major medical challenge that um, brought that back, that opened mm. me back up. And because um, the the medical challenge almost, I, I almost, how do I want to say it? Um, uh, my mind, body, spirit, soul was, was shutting down. And so um, I realized that if I was, if I didn't take action, whatever that was, I didn't know what that was at the time. Uh, but if I didn't take action, I wasn't going to be around much longer. Mm. So um, I, uh, and I've, I've written about it in some of the anthology books I'm in, and I've talked about it over the years in different shows. So I'll say it in this one too. I took my test and this is, this is the power and this is about what I'd, I'd like for people to, to understand about the power of thoughts, the power of our energy, the power of our intention. I took my fist, I raised it to the sky, and from the depths of my soul, from my will, I said, you know, I, I can't do this anymore. Take me or heal me. Well, obviously, I'm still here, and <laughs> it wasn't my time to go. And so was it a little once, bit of both? Yes, and, and I, you know, that declaration literally shifted my paradigm mm -hmm. and that things started showing up, people started showing up. And that's where um, I started to become more aware. It's like these little doors were opening inside my, my mind and my heart. And, it, and I was like a kid in a candy store. I couldn't sure. get enough of all that new information that I totally aligned with, uh, which was coming back to my authentic self. Now it's taken from 40 to today, age 42 today, to um, unravel it all and uh, you know, rebuild uh, stronger, wiser, uh, with understanding, you know, with grace, with strength. And, um, and it's, a it's a continuous process. You know, I, I have, I'm not, I'm not stopping anytime I, soon. It, it's kind of continuous from our childhood. It's just yeah. that we don't necessarily, until we get old enough to look back and look at those mm, dots or points on the, the map, you know, as, as we made our journey <clears throat> that helped imbue it with that sense of interconnectedness. And so speaking of the interconnectedness, what are the kinds of things that you noticed that helped you to recognize what that interconnection was and the significance of it through those various periods of your life? That's a great question. Um, I would have to say the awareness and the knowledge of what was missing, that some part of me knew it was still there, mm -hmm. but, it, but it was missing in my current, you know, living my current in the now life. And as I started to bring that awareness into my everyday living, um, meditation, my master's in transpersonal psychology, understanding the mind-body connection, all the things that, that were surfacing to help me heal from my medical crisis and mm -hmm. to, to brighten my, um, my feel, to brighten my, uh, my, um, my being. So I have friends who to this day tell me, who saw me through that whole process, that I looked like I was 100 years old back then. Mm. You know, I, I was dragging myself through life. And as I started to heal and I started to shed that self that was not authentically me, that light of who I am shining from within externally well, started to be visible. Yeah. I, I... And it's a it's an amazing process, especially when you can reflect and see it in yourself and have the reflection of others as well. And when you're going through that period of, of let's just say disconnectedness, it's like your energy is being uh, maybe ask I'll ask this question. Did it feel like <laughs> your energy was being 
um, usurped or, or taken away because of your current desire to participate in the world in the way that you thought was appropriate. Yes, the words that are coming to mind is um, depleted mm -hmm. and um, diminished. Um, I, I was told when I was getting my, my it was so funny, when I was getting my life coaching certification, um, the instructor actually pulled me aside the second day and said, you've got to tone it down, your light's too bright. And I came home and told Trevor, I got sent to the principal's office because I was expressing myself too authentically in, in the class. And I think he felt probably it was overshadowing, you know, maybe the other people who weren't as far along in their growth as I was. <laughs> I was I'm, like, oh gosh. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I remember one of my key experiences in second grade, I remember was my principal uh, came in to substitute for my second grade teacher. And she was kind of disciplinary, and and uh, I'd known her for a while, obviously, and but not really. But she was talking, and she'd said something. I remember rolling my eyes a couple <laughs> of times, and she eventually says, "You know, Mr. Benefield, if you roll your eyes one more time, I'm going to show you the paddle." And I'm like, "Cool, I want to see it." <laughs> Didn't realize what she meant, you uh, know. So at that time. You know, we're at this literal translation stage that um, doesn't often bode well, right? No. Well, hopefully she didn't show you the paddle. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> that was, you know, corporal punishment or, uh, was still available. Still, still part of it, yeah. Well, sorry that you yeah. had to go through that. But there's, now, there's you mentioned the, I... the diminishing and, and the... Uh, what was the other word that you used? Uh, uh, yeah, it was diminished and... Um, and then like minimized and-, and, and How, uh, what did you notice were the key factors in what was allowing slash causing that? I didn't have good boundaries. I didn't, I didn't know that I was like an open book, you know, that, that just had this assumption that people thought like I thought and behaved in the way that I behaved and mm -hmm. looked at the world in the way that I do. Um, I was too trusting, too forgiving, too yes, a, a, too much of a yes person. Um, definitely a giver, give, 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 and not understanding what I needed to do to get that exchange. Because if we give, we deplete ourselves of the reservoir. Unless it's reciprocal, and, and that's where the yes. boundary issues come in yes. and, and how you adjust those over time. And yes. also and how when you I do, was, right? Yes, yeah. Well, also how I was enabling. I was an enabler of people uh, bringing to me experiences that really disrespected me as a female, as um, you know, someone who's friendly and kind and gentle and giving, um, you know, there's people out there that prey on those who have a, a where the heart Unfortunately, honestly, they yeah. do, right? Yes, yes. And so what it has taught me along the way, once I got through the initial stages of the healing and I, and I started to, I started to um, build upon this knowledge that I gained of, oh, this is who you really are. So what does it take to show up as that person in the world, not of it, where um, we're not stripped and we're not depleted and we're not, um, you know, our energy isn't being taken all the time. Right. Um, now, there's a, a philosophy that said, you know, what is it, um, that we're actually co-creators in our own reality. Right. Absolutely, yes. So is it, uh, did you ever, or is it possible that those um, diminishing personalities that show up in your life, right, were they actually attracted to you in order for you to grow into setting boundaries? And, and at what point, if that is so, did you realize it? Oh, gosh, yes, yes, yes. And, and you know, that's one of the things in life that I, I still struggle with is that that word polarity you know life has to have polarity 
hot, cold, up, down, the list goes on. If we don't have that polarity, we cannot grow. So I've had to accept kicking and screaming <laughs> mm -hmm. that those experiences are going to show up. Fortunately, as I started to recognize, oh, that person's bringing me something I don't like, doesn't feel good. So what do I need to do to, right. um, to, to minimize those experiences coming in to teach that person how to treat me? So it's not looking at the other person as the blame, as the, the um, catalyst. They are, but there's something in me, there's something that I haven't fully developed enough that they know off the off the car you know they know right away i can't bring this to that person kind of so like you when, have the experience to bring you both to a new level yeah um, there's yeah. what was it shakespeare said uh nothing is good or bad it's thinking that makes it so oh okay so that's a perfect quote to to uh segue into my next comment which is uh, uh the most important thing that i have learned through this whole journey from, from birth to now mm -hmm. is how powerful our thoughts are. They, I believe, are more powerful than anything else. And my, my understanding is thoughts come first because if you quiet your mind, there's nothing there and nothing happens. Oh, it's now, interesting that you mentioned nothing. Okay, I, pardon me for- That's uh, okay. I'm excited about this because from nothing, right? There's yes. this notion that's presented in just about every ancient text that you can imagine about nothingness and that all things come from that and that we've kind of lost perspective of yeah. what that's like, which indicates that, okay, it, that's our thoughts, right? How we think, feel, believe, perceive, conceive is precursive to how we act. So, but it all works. But it all works together. I mean, that's it it, that's the that's the that's to me is the gift that we're given in the life that we have been born into is to um, understand the uh, the incredible opportunities we have to create to co-create with the principles that are that can't be changed in the universe. That's part of our everyday living. So. Many times I'll go sit out in nature and I'll just sit and observe and and I kind of, you know, just think about, well, what's going on out there? Is it impacting me? And when I'm in my space in the now, I don't feel anything and I don't need to, but I can see all the action. I can see all the things going on. But in my life, in that moment, in that space, um, there's nothingness, but there is still activity going on because whatever I have thought previously and actions I have taken previously are already in motion. So whenever I'm wanting to intend for something to happen, I take a uh, like a rain check on, uh, okay, what did I do five minutes ago, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, and how is that related to- It sets up your now moment. Yes, and it can go far back, which is something I want to bring up that um, goes back to almost the beginning of our conversation. In my studies, in my education, in my higher awareness, I realize something very key for adults to kind of think about, food for thought. We have different stages of growth, right, in our, in our childhood. That sets us up. Cycles. cycles. Yes, yeah. I like that. <laughs> but we, we have those. Um, that creates the foundation of who we become as adults. What I have firmly come to, to uh, understand is the autonomy stage is very rarely fully developed. So we spend our adult life trying to fulfill that stage. And now, the autonomy- Do you yeah. feel in that, because I know you're, you're speaking from experience and, and I can relate, how do you, and you see my movement, because there's a push uh -huh. and a pull there right, is. That, that happens in that place when what we're really seeking is flow, right? And at least that's what I conceive it to be. Yeah. 
could be wrong. Uh, you know, in that place of flow is where we find the the aspect of our lives of being of loving and being loved, and that's where, where that um, balance and, and harmony come in. Um, yes, doesn't do much to eliminate the chaos or the perceived chaos. It just allows us to see it differently and maybe recognize some patterns in it. As you're talking about looking at the the long-term or, or even short-term rear view mirror mm -hmm. with the question, okay, how did I set that up? And what can I change to alter that in the next cycle? Yeah. The uh, important caveat to all of that is we all want to be seen, valued, heard, and understood. Mm -hmm. And that autonomy stage is where that gets developed when we learn how to uh, communicate with others so that uh, we are seen, valued, heard, and understood as our authentic self. The challenge is how many people are raised to say, tell me, tell me who you are, child of mine. Tell me how you want to be a child of mine. How do you want to, you know, live your life when you become an adult? We never ask those questions. Instead, we're told how to be, we're told how to act, we're told how to you know, respond to our world experiences. Now, I will say that in America, yes. Now, I've found um, having married a Russian, then she went through their educational system, started at, at five years old, was uh, picked out to be a pianist. Mm. And so what I found out was they actually assess the children as to what their skill set, their aptitude, their attitude, their passion for different things. And then they nurtured that in such a way, you know, she went all the way through conservatory and became a world-class pianist and accompanist. Um, and their whole culture is built like that. So even Mr. Putin was picked very young in order to nurture him through to the leader that he is today. And so these kinds of things in America and probably other, you know, um, developing nations haven't been paid attention to for some reason. Do you find that there are some indicators that that is changing? Because the kids today are learning, you know, the for whatever reasons, and we could probably, you know, have a litany of them. <clears throat> they learn differently they act yeah. differently they understand things differently than previous generations and and that may be because of the impact of where we're at in our own planetary cycle not yeah. really, although it seems that way what do you see in that and do as i said before do you see that um, bar being raised i think the the younger generations are trying to raise that bar um, they are being raised in a different world than you and I and older generations. So there's a push-pull right now that's mm -hmm. going on where um, the differences of um, perception of how life uh, would be the most in the flow and, and harmonious mm -hmm. and loving. Uh, I being think a transpersonal psychologist, though, in looking at how the kids behave, respond, and, and so forth, we attempt to, it seems, instead of listening to them, understanding them, peering into them more to understand why, we tend to label them, diagnose them, drug them, and yeah. put them in a box that we think they ought to be in. How can we change that? You know, that's a, that's a big question, not just a great question, but a big question. Thank and you. I think there's, I think there's a, there's a lot of people out there wanting to be a part of that change. Um, I know there's a lot of children that are confused. A lot of these younger generation are confused because right. they're being told one thing and they're being asked to do something opposite. So they're, they're being pulled in two different directions. And they're not sure where they fit. Right. So it's kind it's of outer the same. Cognitive dissonance. It's not the yes. inner, right? This yeah, is outside. So I, was... <laughs> like, I, I hear you saying this, you're doing this. What do I, you know, how do right. I make sense of this? 
And I think that's why we have all these epidemics going on um, in uh, in the mental health and the in the spiritual health and the you know emotional just, health. Yeah, yeah, just living life. And, and you know what I have seen in my own experience and working with others and building the the platform that Trevor and I have built is um, uh, the the desire of people to want to get back to the heart center. I think people are tired of the fighting and this mudslinging and the, um, you know, the, the division that's going on. And, and we really want to be in a unified um, presence with each other where we can all be our own individual selves, as long as it's presented in a way that we're, we're uplifting others. You know, there's, there's no excuse to, to be ourselves and, and take others down. So, right, right. Yeah, so you fed so, right into the whole um, message behind Live and Let Live Global Peace Movement that I'm now executive director of. You know, two principles, live and let live. Well, what's yeah. that mean? We've got the moral principle that's be a good human, right? Which is kind of what you're talking about. This is what we're, for lack of a better, ascending to. And then the legal principle of let live means don't be an aggressor right and so part of what we seek to do is long term change the laws and legislation to eliminate aggression so it would effectively effectively make war illegal boy that would be awesome you know it's funny because ever since i can remember i've always had this vision and sometimes i'll bring it up in conversation and i say wouldn't it be nice if we gave people flowers to throw at each other versus guns with bullets <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Even, That's a power yeah, child just, in me. How do we talk to each other? How do we get beyond <laughs> all the, you know, we see diversity and we and we see it as difference, and yeah. and so it creates that separation. You're different than me, so I don't like you, right? right. Instead of, wow, what can I learn? This is different. This is new. You know, what can I gain? How, what can I share? How can we learn to work together to utilize our differences in order to make things better for all of us? Yes, and that's the world I think a lot of people are trying to co create, not only with uh, each other, but globally. And um, there's an effort, you know, you had to live and let live. We have the Airtel Universe, the Universal Voice. We bring on a ton of. Um, uh, partners and alliances, which you are a part of, so thank you. And uh, and I and I think we're strong. I think we're stronger together. The more that we can build upon this matrix, right, mm -hmm. versus the matrix that's um, similar to the Matrix movie, where you know there's that suppression and the darkness and the and the inability for people to be able to be seen, valued, heard, and understood in a way that that honors their authentic self. So there's right. a lot of, you know, there's a lot of levels and layers and tangent, but um, individually we can uh, do our part by doing deep dives into who am I, why am I here? Am I being as um, graceful and as giving and receiving exchange with harmony, with peace, you know, all the, all the fluff words, but they have meaning. They have they have substance to them. And oh, they certainly do, and they have change. I was watching a, an NPR video about non-complementary behavior. Interesting. Now that sounds like, and you being a transpersonal uh, psychologist, I, I'm assuming you're familiar with that. I wasn't. And it's framed like this, you know, complementary behavior is that if I come at you in any kind of terse way or angry or whatever, then you're going to respond the same, right? Because we look to mirror each other. When we get energy, right. we give it back in the same way that we receive it. Now, non-complementary behavior is doing it differently. And they were using uh, an illustration of a robber that came to a dinner party that one of the mm -hmm. members of the dinner party eventually offered the robber a glass of wine instead of, uh, you know, what would your mother think? Or, you know, you sure, you know, all the negative projections. Right. And right. she just very kindly said, would you like to have a glass of wine? And the demeanor, and it, this was an actual event, totally changed. 
Yeah. That he eventually, you know, put his gun back in his pocket, sat down, had some cheese, and then even said, hey, you know, this is going to sound really weird, but can I have a hug? Yeah. And see, that goes back to my my phrase. Everybody wants to be seen, valued, heard, and understood. So there's something in that person's past experience where he didn't feel it, and all he knows to do is to act out in the way that he was acting. But this person at that at that dinner um, has the skill to be able to tame that part of him enough to get him to realize he doesn't have to be that way. Right. You know that there's there's the uh, always an opportunity to have a healthy exchange, no matter how aggressive someone is towards you. And um, I call that the power of the pause. You, you hit the pause button on life. I love and, that one. Uh, you know. right? <laughs> <laughs> so you hit the pause button on life and you're like, okay, so how's, you know, where's this getting you? How's that working for pause you? Pause and reflect. Yes. And Ask let's, questions. let's, yes. And let's, let's go over here and see how else we can, we can uh, connect with each other and communicate. Cause I like to say life is a series of conversations. Whether it's with back. yourself or others. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so um, for me, my journey has uh, been a gift uh, through the trials and tribulations, through the hardships, through the um, the things that could have destroyed me, whether it was people or uh, the health crisis. But there's a part of me that is strong enough, is that will that kicked in. Um, that knowledge that's deep within that's like, no, 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 you know, you're, you're on trial by fire and it's your, you the know, fiery life, furnace. yes. <laughs> and, uh, life's a master teacher and we're teaching you, you're the student. So it's funny as I, as I, as I, um, continue on this path and journey, I can recognize and I can see right away and it makes me laugh when I'm in school again, when mm -hmm. I'm in a lesson. And if the lesson keeps repeating itself, it um, it just causes me to dig my heels in even stronger to figure out what do I still need to do so this stop. And there is one particular area in my life that I keep having the same experience, and um, and and I'm having to work through it. And and it and, it, and it's it's I, I'm kind of looking at it as um, it's going to strengthen me when I come through. And, and I think um, each time is not as strong, but it's definitely a pattern. You mentioned patterns earlier. And it's um, about cycles, rhythms, patterns. It's all math. Yeah. It's all math. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> and then we figure out the science once we, once we uh, realize that, oh, the magic actually has some substance to it. It does. That it, it does. Yeah. And we can get a tap on the shoulder. If we don't look and say, oh, so then uh, we get like a shake. And if we don't uh, wake up from the shake, then we get that two by four. And that's when you really got to sit down and say, okay, something has to change. You right. know, there's, there's... Now, do you notice in that process that there was a period where you realized that you'd ask questions and you'd answer them with uh, the information that you already had? and not understanding how to be quiet yet and there's yeah. or do you i know for me i tend to still want to do that even knowing that okay i get i shut up dude <laughs> no right let yourself whatever that higher aspect is answer the question because that's the one that's got the answers you don't have yeah. it or you wouldn't be asking the questions Yes, I mean, you hit it on the nail. Um, when I was going through my, my medical crisis, I kept asking, before I did my declaration, mm -hmm. I kept asking, why me? Why me? Why, why, why? But I didn't do the power of the pause. I didn't sit long enough for that answer to come through me I and know. for that answer to show up. So I had to go through the trials and the tribulations because I was too stubborn to listen. So part of the meditation and the mindfulness that I practice daily in everything I do um, has helped me to to listen, speak less, talk less, which is really hard for a female. Oh my gosh, you know, we want to tell the story. We want to 
go round and round. We want to give all the details, but I've learned there's times where I have to be quiet. I gotta listen, you know, just it's not that much <laughs> different for guys. Yeah, uh, that, like that can be true. Too, and <laughs> I had to learn when to shut up. Because uh, sometimes I say too much and, you know, I tend to, and you know me fairly well, and, and we can talk to those depths, but I tend to kind of jump into conversations and dive right in and lose people in the process. Yeah, and I didn't I, understand I, that for years because I, I understand what I'm saying, right? <laughs> well, that as an ed, then as an educator, I had to realize, oh, okay, I may understand something. However, I've got to be able to explain it to every person in the audience in their understanding first yes. before I can then take them someplace else. We've all got to be on the same page and we don't do that. How do you see that evolving in, in, in your process, especially, right? Being, uh, going through that traumatic period, being able to pull the nuggets out and share those with others who may be going through similar things. How did That's... that help you in, in that process of, recog of recognizing yourself? It, um, it took a while to realize that, uh, again, uh, you know, because of my circumstances and my awareness being heightened because of the hearing loss that people are not walking in this world the same way I do. And I, I, I had to understand that myself first in order to be able to explain what I've been through, what I've experienced that's real to me, mm -hmm. that may be something that others wouldn't understand because they haven't been through it. Right. And, and, and um, the words that you use too, the, the articulation, uh, one word can have multiple meanings depending on where the listener's ears are. It, exactly. Yes. Yes. And um, so I've learned uh, discernment and who I can say what and how much and when to listen or how to listen to when I can give more information. Right. I and, think you call that discernment, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, it is discernment. And it's okay to um, meet people where they are, but at the same time, um, strive to bring them to the, to the awareness that um, you are, because then you're, you're on that same playing field and you don't get that sandpaper or that, you know, that, that, um, two magnets mm -hmm. that are resisting each other. You know, if we have conflict and resistance, um, you're not meeting, you know, you're, you're not right. meeting in the middle. There's, uh, there's as, discourse. Going back to the, the way we learn, right? We know the basics of auditory, kinesthetic and, and visual. And yet, how do we, you know, we, we know those things. You notice the difference of, of intellect, heart and gut too, right? Yeah. Well, how do we think about things? How do we emote about things? And then how do we feel about them? Because the feelings and the, emo and the emoting are necessarily congruent, right? So there's three different, like the indigenous say, you know, you've got your first brain, second brain, third brain. Yes. And that's where you're connected to all the vibrations. That way. That's where you feel everything. And the heart kind of discerns what it is, right? Because you're looking for that empathic, empathic resonance. And if there's not, then that's where the questions come up. And then you move into the brain, which is where you have the opportunity to make the choices as to what to do with the information. Yeah. And there's also intuition and all of that. Right. Well, that's the gut. Correct. Yes. And I think a lot of people, um, well, I know for myself, understanding my intuitive resonance of the truth within what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. So um, I practice ensuring that if I have a negative feeling, not to look out here, not to look out here as, as the reason behind it. Instead, um, to see where am I feeling it in my body 
so that I can bring a better light upon whatever is causing that negative feeling. Mm -hmm. But do you find that there's also the need for um, confirmation, validation, uh, correlation with the other, right? Because, and, and the reason I ask that is because we generally, we internalize these things. We, we do a lot of self-examination. <clears throat> How do we check in, right? In this communication exchange, what are the kind, can you suggest a, a language or a way in which we can check in with the other to see if they're in a similar place or recognized what they said or the, the action that they took was somehow incongruent in, in exchanging that sense of, of togetherness. Because oftentimes yeah. we don't intend to do that. We don't intend to create situations that cause distance between us. Exactly. Right? We want to do just the opposite. However, in our normal behavior, sometimes that just doesn't happen. So how do we check in and then reflect to another and bring them into the conversation effectively? Yeah, that's, that's a tremendous question because part of my journey has been under the auspices of the communication and, and teaching others what to bring into the experience. Mm -hmm. and I think I kind of mentioned that a little at the beginning of our conversation. Um, what has become tools in my toolbox is validation. The most powerful tool that I've learned, which I can thank Trevor for because he's taught that, uh, which I now teach the, um, uh, the, the power of validation. But it is um, uh, helping the other person to understand who you are by letting them know, this is the kind of person I am. You know, I am uh, kind, I'm gentle. Anything I do is always from the perspective of um, how can we communicate together in a, in a harmonious way. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and how do you do that without triggering the other? I think NVC, nonviolent communication, is one of those methodologies yes. where you yeah. you don't put it on the other person. You acknowledge how you feel and what happened caused that feeling. And then you ask for, is that what you intended? Uh, yes. And that's the direction I was heading. And so right, cool. you, you cool. gave cool. me. Kind of left ahead. <laughs> yeah. So you, you gave me a segue. Um, the, the verbiage that we use is you, you have to leave the pronouns out because as soon as you say you, you're pointing the finger at the other person, they feel attacked and they're going to be triggered. So it's, it's um, talking to the emotion that's behind the words or the actions. When I experience uh, the uh, words uh, that are coming at me that, that are negative, it doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. And I prefer to feel good. So or you therefore, perceive them to be. Right. right. It doesn't always well, mean that they are. Well, I, it, they... Sometimes I, it's obvious, but... Right, yeah, there's a, well... There's subtle movements that get in the way, right? Right. Well, it's putting it on me. I don't feel good with those words being presented to me. So mm -hmm. therefore, in the future, using the word, uh, would you please, or would you... Uh, you know, would you? What's the alternatives? Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's like what I, I and, and anything I, I do, whether it's coaching or talking with people, um, it's thinking of if something doesn't feel good, what's the opposite word that can be used? What's the opposite thought that can be used? And that's whether it's your own doing or somebody else doing it to you, mm -hmm. uh, that you think it's being done to you. Uh, really, everything is being processed through us. So nothing is well, too it's so full of victimization. Yes. Right. Yeah. That perception. Yeah. And and what happens is it it becomes this this circle of give take give take until we can break that that cycle that is keeping that high mental energy going. And so the validation brings them out of the head and into the heart. Self-validation also helps when you learn how to self-validate yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's 
We'll just know yeah. that you're okay, right? What yeah. is that? Uh, oh, what kind of movement? I'm okay. You're okay. What was that? Uh, uh, I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I, I think, think that actually that. had to do with the transpersonal development, right? Yeah. Well, there's there's a lot involved in transpersonal um, understanding and psychology. Uh, the key is what is transpiring between your heart, your mind, your thoughts. And how is that impacting your outer world and your life? Mm -hmm. And when we built the Ochel Universe platform, it was all about a universal voice, giving people the ability to have a voice for their passion, vision, dream, so they feel heard, valued, understood, so they can feel a part of the world that um, allows them to be their authentic self. And we need more of that. So then we have healthy conversation and communication where things are not misunderstood, assumed, um, you know, misconstrued. And it, it just, when we can do that pause and listen for the other person to find out where they are, what is their pain point that we're feeling, because really we're, we're, we're picking up something from the other person that's triggering us. If we don't have that own pain point ourselves, then we won't be feeling negative. We won't be feeling um, anything other than hearing their their distress right. and offering to to um, uh, to to quell that for them. What are the kinds of questions that one asks self to unpack those things? Oh wow! Um, okay, let's see if I can give you a couple examples. Uh, we can ask ourselves. Why am I angry? What's the opposite of anger? What's the opposite of anger for you, Sam? Hmm. I, hmm. Um, gosh, that's a tough one because I haven't experienced that for a while. <laughs> I, I suppose um, anger would be um, feeling embraced. Okay, so I could ask myself, if I'm angry about something, what would it take for me to feel embraced? What do I, I mean, just saying those words, anger versus feeling embraced, I don't know if you can feel it, but I can feel there's a difference in the weight, you know, words have weight, and there's a difference in how it's, it's coursing through my body as I say the words. So just by asking that question, how can I feel embraced? you're going to start bringing up experiences where maybe you didn't feel embraced and you want to. So how can you um, bring in, in the now, a present experience where you feel embraced and then, you know, uh, nurture that? Because the past is just an experience. We're looking in the rearview mirror, pedal to the metal, and we're going to crash. So I say, stop looking in the rearview mirror other than to pick some nuggets from it, as you mentioned earlier, and, and focus on now. What do you have now? What, what goodness, what beauty, what value, what gifts can you find, the magic, the mystery of life that can allow your life to be where you're living it now, fully, living it fearlessly, living it, living your dream. Those are my taglines now, living fearlessly, living the dream, living life to the fullest. What are and you afraid of? Right. What are you afraid of? Right. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of things to, to fear. You don't want to put yourself, your hand in, in, in a fire. But when it comes to pursuing the things that you enjoy, there, there's, there's no reason to be fearful. Sure. I totally agree with you. And, and oftentimes it's that, <clears throat> what are the, the imposter syndrome that shows up, right? That I don't know yeah. if I'm enough, if I have enough, and, and, you know, am I enough kind of questions. And yet, you wouldn't have the desire to do something if you weren't enough, in my opinion. And, and I think that I'm exploring that too, right? We, we have these magnificent, almost um, phenomenal kinds of self-views from moment to moment. We don't often take the opportunity or, or you know, we don't often create the opportunity to explore those because we're resistant. Oh, I, I, I'm not going to be successful. We know how to fail, right? We do it all the time. <laughs> <And each laughs> I like to say of, fail up. <laughs> exactly. 
And, and it's yeah. the whole thing of these are the stepping stones. It's like Edison learning how to make the light bulb. You, you, you know, figure out how to 99 ways not to. And yet there are other things that come out of those ancillary results that aren't aimed at the target, right? Or fulfilling the goal. And they, they can still be useful. We tend to discard all of those things as, I don't want that, you know, failure's not an option. Well, how'd you get there? You failed a bunch of times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have me thinking about um, how uh, everybody has a story. I believe everybody has some story uh, of trials and tribulations of overcoming, of, you know, something that they've achieved. And through that story, they can inspire others. So if someone says, I'm not enough, am I enough? They're comparing themselves to others. We, we don't need to compare ourselves. All that we need to do, or I shouldn't even say need, I don't like the word need. Right. All that can be beneficial is- You're good for um, more. Yes. <laughs> that commercial, right? Yeah. Now, this also, it, it stems from indigenous philosophy, the storytellers, you know, the yeah. villages had these storytellers that impart the wisdom for various stages of maturation, because that's how they all were taught. And then they were able to reflect on that because these stories were embedded. We haven't told stories for all too long, probably since before we, in America, since before we started taking the land and calling yeah. it our own <clears throat> when there was already inhabitants here. Yes. And that was kind of not a good thing to do. And and I wonder if that's kind of reflecting on now where we're actually returning to those kinds of activities that were the core of what the philosophy of the indigenous people were. Not necessarily how, you know, the actions are always different, right? Because we... Right see those and, and have all kinds of different compartments we like to put them in. However, the general sense of the sharing, the, it's, the people that are different in their sensitivities have specific roles in the society to take advantage of those sensitivities for the village. Yes, I call them the wisdom keepers. And, yeah. and what I'm What's coming to my mind is how we have discarded the uh, older generation, the elders of our generations, um, as uh, not worthy of information that can be passed on or passed down. And I think that's part of the challenge that you were talking about how earlier. How do we get there? Which, what, why yeah. do we do that? Well, I, I don't know what caused the inability for us to look at the older generation as a source and a resource for information that could be beneficial to the younger generation. Um, I, I think the technology age has something to do with it. I haven't, I haven't really delved into the understanding of why we don't honor the elders today. And That's why- just came up, I, you know, cause I asked the question and, and as you were speaking, I, I, there was this notion that, well, it has to do with kind of a general personality development of a country or a nation or world for that matter, mm -hmm. right? Because there are, each country has its own personality because of how it grew up, yes. right? So for us, then we're kind of like teenagers. We think we know everything. And my dad used to tell me that, and he told me this story, but thrice removed it said you know he said well my dad told me that his dad used to say you know my dad got a lot smarter from the time i was 15 to the time i was <laughs> right and, and he did his intelligence didn't change it's just that we grow into that awareness that oh yeah life experience gosh that does offer a lot of knowledge and wisdom that i don't have yet right and I think that's part of the challenge today because the younger generation is growing up with so much inf information overload, I like to call it, that they think they have all they need to know. But life experiences is teaching them a little different. And so there's that confusion. Right. And um, well, you're feeding the head, not the body. And, and right. our bodies are instruments we haven't learned how to tune yet, let alone play in concert. Yes. Yeah. So it's all about the dance and, you know, 
we're willing to dance the, the element of life itself and dance with each other as, as human beings. And I know you like to say also spirits living the human experience. We, we have a spiritual part of us that has that higher connection of wanting to belong and be a part of. But if we're not dancing together, if we're not moving together, if we're not flowing together, there's that disharmony and dissonance. So we, we work a lot. Oh, I'm sorry, let me just finish this thought. We no, work I a lot seen. with, yeah, we work a lot with music. You know, we, we, we do music productions and, and we work with musicians. And, you know, I, I believe music uh, is, is key in understanding our, um, how, how we are in the world with the connection to the universal energies. I, I mean, think it's and, a first language. Yes, right? it probably Before is. Words developed, there was music. Yes, and, it's uh, a universal language, absolutely. Right. And we can't the, think our way through a system built on vibration. We have to feel our way through it. Well, how do we do that? Well, and think about the songs. You know, songs come through musicians. They're not from the musician. So where's it coming from? Where's all these, these amazing especially from the 1960s and 70s, you know, the music that came out of that era was just incredible and still- It was, um, a, rev it was a revolution in consciousness. Yeah, so I think we're on a precipice of making another shift uh, as a revolution of humanity, trying to maybe come back to center to then figure out what's that next stage after the the uh, onset of the technology era, what, what's that next one look like? Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, if we, if we watch too many movies of the, um, you know, the, the computers and the, and the robots taking over, we're, we're in trouble. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. uh, there's there's so know. much fear of AI and, and really, again, you know, the, the human dynamic, our ability to make choices and, and be moral and ethical in them has been downplayed by the drive for power and control. Yeah. And now we're realizing, oh, that doesn't work either. No. Right? No. I think the silver lining of the pandemic, which is the epitome of the command and control globally, right? That was one, yeah. it wasn't a threat from elsewhere that brought us all together. It was a threat from right here among us that taught us first from one narrative to be afraid of each other and, and sequestrate in the process and then there was oh wait a minute that's not really happening the people were looking around they were starting to see different information that was contrary to the narrative and they're like wait a minute we want to be together yes. we want to find ways to come out of this and 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 be better humans in the process and i think that's happening we're more caring and compassionate at least some are Yes, there's exactly. still uh, probably the majority that are, <clears throat> that are in the fear-based system that don't know quite what to do yet because the world is changing so rapidly that they're unable to stay in this um, co-creative capacity. Well, that's what's so great about what you're <clears throat> trying to do with the Live and Let Live and what we're doing with the Ochoa Universe platform is to rise above all of that noise and all of that chaos. Well, in this podcast, this is yes. the, the epitome of that, right? We're having open conversations that are somewhat generative, asking questions, exploring. We don't have the answers, but here how, here's how I did it, right? Here's how you did it. And it's developing those questions and being able to share that information. I think that's all important for others to be able to reflect on. That's, that's so true. And what I always ask myself is how am I showing up today? How do I want to show up today in, uh, when I step into the world and bring what I know from my experiences, the knowledge that I gain, the wisdom that has um, become a part of my platform and share that with others. So, you know, if they want that too, um, we have the ability to to show them and you know i love to ask questions because questions give us the avenue through which um we have a better understanding because as you said things are changing so rapidly and and just to keep up with today 
much less yesterday and what's coming tomorrow, um, we can't, we have, we have, I mean, today it's very hard to predict what's going to come tomorrow. However, we can individually design um, and co-create our intention of what we would like to experience, but then things come in that, that may counter. And so, you know, you have to adapt and pivot and, and, and dance with that mm -hmm. in order to be um, as close to a harmonious relationship with right. yourself, with others in the, in the world. Now, as a transpersonal psychologist, what do you think about all the tools that are available for self-assessments? Um, from astrology to numerology to Myers-Briggs and yeah. those, you know, that kind of span the, the spectrum. Are those things to engage? Absolutely. I think tools are great. Just like, um, you know, you have a, a real toolbox and you've got different tools in there, but you're not going to use them all the time every day for everything. Sure. You have specific tools for specific needs. So I think the more that a person can gather tools, but not, not, not to where you can't carry your toolbox. You know, I've, I've had to cut back on being a, a lifelong scholar because I could study and take classes and learn for the rest of my life and still not get enough. But I've had to put a, I've had to put a break on, you know, realizing, okay, I have enough. Now it's time to live life and use those tools. So what are some of the tools? Meditation to me is, is key. The power of the pause. Um, astrology, you know, you could use it as a basis to understand things. I actually have a friend who just came out with an astrology book that's based on um, business and certain certain uh, numbers for each month can guide you on decision making in your business. It's really cool. It's yeah. not a, it, it's not a pseudoscience like most would like to pretend. No, no. there's there's science yeah. behind it. Oh, there truly is, and and. Yeah there have been great people in the world who have had astrologers helping to guide them. I mean, exactly. we all know about the Nancy Reagan, right? Yes. And yeah. how she used astrology to help her husband. Well, yeah. these kinds of things, we often, because of other kinds of influences, tend to diminish or deny their capability to help. And yeah. we need to explore those things, not be in denial of them. And <clears throat> sometimes, excuse me, when we are told something um, isn't good for us, the first thing we do is go check it out. Right, All right. right. <clears throat> so Early the way recently. I look at, yeah, the way I look at it, these alternative, alternative tools, um, it's just another way to understand the self better, you know, to, to put together, piece together. So... Um, sometimes when I do a coaching session, not sometimes, every time when I do a coaching session, um, when it's a, a personal growth one, uh, we always, I have all kinds of card decks and, and some of them are like Wayne Dyer with, you know, inspirational, um, the four, the four, what is it? The, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the four, um, uh, four agreements, uh, the four agreements, thank you. The four agreements, you know, things like that. And um, I believe, in, again, in the power of words, and oftentimes um, things will, will pop out, but inevitably, 100% of the time, whatever we discuss, whatever was, was transformed, whatever was released, whatever was um, brought into the, the person's awareness, they always show up in whatever cards they pick. And so I, I firmly believe that um, the 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 world, the universe, you know, there's something bigger than us that's always speaking to us and, and it can come through dreams. It can come through books that fall on our lap. It can come through conversation. So, you know, someone can listen to this today and it's going to, a light bulb's going to go off in their head. It's almost like so, it'll come through any door that's open, even if you're, and especially those you're not aware of. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I like to <clears> use <throat> the, the, the cards and books and words and, and, other things because it's it's a support system you know it's it's a way to validate and collaborate what you feel is is right and true and good and um it gives a an extra uh you know like oomph to the fact that i'm on the right track because this is supporting what i thought or what i'm thinking and what i'm what i'm the action I'm taking. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's my take on, on your question. Cool. <laughs>
so let let's um we kind of need to wind down here a little bit let's look at how you can help others with something that, that you could offer for them on a daily basis to be able to help them actualize a greater part of themselves that is this connected self the thing that comes to mind that is critical and key is to stop the chatter in their mind in the head to learn to quiet their mind so that what is uh trying to to get through can come through mm -hmm. and be able to give you those golden nuggets that um will be beneficial for that that personal and business growth and and help remove eliminate diminish the uh the fears the uncertainty the uh parts of ourselves that sabotage and be able to walk your path showing up authentically yourself are there any like really tasty tidbit questions that tend to reveal the most in that process or at least have the most impact in, in allowing that deluge of information to take place afterwards um, yes uh probably what's my purpose when i was when i was healing from my medical crisis i worked with a friend of mine that was getting his life coaching certification mm -hmm. and he took me on as one of his case studies and we worked a few weeks on the, the wording and and you know just setting the mindset for the intention to, to allow the uh, life purpose statement to come through me. Now, my background's marketing and advertising and, um, you know, leadership and all of that. So I thought, oh, it's going to be easy. You know, it's going to have to do with marketing and advertising. Well, I was so wrong. What came through me and I, and I, you know, I was, I somehow shifted into this space where I automatic, did automatic writing. And when I, Put the pen down and i looked at the paper i was in shock because what i wrote was um i'm a shining light to show people the way or guiding light i'm a guiding light to show people the way and ever since that statement came through me i based a lot of the action decisions i take on what does that mean for me and what does that look like in what i do for myself and what i do for others mm -hmm. So I think understanding, you know, the life purpose statement, but that 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 compass, that inner compass of who we are, that authentic self, is um, always wanting to come through. And if, if we're not sure about who that that core is of who we are, um, that question, uh, you know, why am I here? What's my purpose? Can give a foundation from which to launch from to build that uh that life of living fearlessly purposefully fully cool and yeah the dream and especially now those things are important with this massive global change that's happening from all kinds of things and uh and being able to restructure our lives accordingly and doing what it is that we like to do or maybe even love to do better yes and i would offer that that guiding light comes through it in multiple ways because what you're doing with the production that's digital most of it yeah. and yeah. what's digital it's all light pulses right <laughs> right <laughs> right so different frequencies different you know all that kind of stuff and it definitely goes back into that sense of feeling your way through the system built on vibrations Yes. And, and I think that's under studied, you know, the, the idea of, of energy and vibration and connection. And uh, if that can become more of our core understanding of being a human, then um, what comes into our life, a uh, person's life, will be better understood. And then it what action be. can be taken sure. to course correct if need be. Now, it seems that complexology and the study of consciousness and quantum physics are all, you know, leaning towards that aspect of consciousness that is driving the bus. Right? Yeah. They figured out who the driver is. 
Yes, and I think science and spirituality are, are starting to bridge, you know, Absolutely. they're starting to work together as time goes along. Well, the Absolutely. two are actually, when you look at it, they're one. It's just, it's the magic that we didn't understand that we have little bits and pieces of from time to time in our lives that sprinkle it with these, you know, magical moments. And then, and then we go back to the turmoil and, you know, wade through stuff <laughs> and still have these, you know, uh, moments of, of ecstasy, if you will. And then we begin to figure out, oh, I can think this way, I can do this, and eventually I'll see that appear. And it's a process, just like scientific method. Yes. Only it's not data-driven, it's process-driven, and the results are empathically resonant with your being in the process. And that yes. probably sounds like, oh man, I, you know, I, I'm on the moon again trying to talk to earthlings right? i was gonna say zim you got your head in the clouds right now <laughs> heck with the clouds i'm sitting on the moon man um, well and i think that's the challenge is that that people will automatically go to what's he talking about but um but there's there's groundedness in it and and they ask, think they don't understand when they um, say when they ask that question what's he talking about it's like uh, they're assuming they don't understand that okay. only means that Either they haven't got the, uh, <clears throat> what do they call it in lesson plans, the uh, the pre-learning, right? The prior knowledge that's necessary to understand it, or I haven't articulated it correctly. And that goes back to what you said earlier, being able to speak someone's language and, you know, where they are at for them to uh, to understand. And, and, you know, it's... it's um, uh, it's a process of self-discovery, deep dive, and when you really truly know yourself and what you will and will not accept into your life, what works, what doesn't work, then um, it's going out into the world and, and teaching others, you know, this is how I want to live, this is how I want to be, if you want to join me, great, but you've got to be, you know, in, in the boundaries of what works for me. And, um, you know, and, and if you like the way I'm living, great, join me and join Zen and, you know, let's do this together and, and make the world a, a, a amazing, don't leave, don't follow, place. walk beside me. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, yeah. and that's what's great about what you're doing and what the Airtel Universe is doing, because it's building a web, a network, a family, a community that just continues to expand and grow because it's more what people want. I mean, when you wake up in the morning, you don't wake up and go, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna, I'm gonna scream and yell all day long and be unhappy, right? We wake up and we-, we Who can I connect to, with? What can I do? What can I create? Right. You know, it, it's exciting right. every day. It's a new day to do cool stuff. Yeah, and, and I get excited when I add someone to our platform, when I add someone to the, um, partners and alliances and I just added a whole nother page yes this past couple of days and you know it it I feel good that uh, I can make a difference and a positive impact on individuals companies organizations bands right. musicians because um, uh, I want people to be happy you know we want people to feel good in life so it's, it's the only one we have, right? Happens, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. it's the only one we have. Uh, it's not a trial, you know. I mean, once once it's it's expired, it's expired. So why not live it to the fullest while you can? Be as little children. Yeah. Eileen, I totally appreciate the time you've shared with us today and the conversation we've had. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I appreciate you so much in the work that you do. And that will be shared in the description below for our viewers as well. So thank, thank you, Zen. Yes, no, thank you and Namaste for having me on the show. And I've, I've enjoyed this conversation. I'm sure we can expand on it even more. <laughs> and Namaste and in la catch. Thank you so much for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel and I will see you next time.